Welcome to week 10 and welcome to Stats versus Film, our flagship show here on this channel where we take everything that happened on the field this past weekend, Thursday, Sunday, Monday night, and mix it with Hayden Winks, the big old nerd, and his stats, his spreadsheets, his analytics, everything that you need to know in the hopes of finding the answer that lies somewhere in between. Hayden, I will say, as soon as we get to double-digit weeks, it puts like a little pep in my step because I can like finally start looking at the finish line, if I'm honest. Yeah, speaking of finish line, I'll have some charts comparing last year's finishes to this year's finishes. Ooh. So we'll get into all that type of stuff as well. How many nerds, though, have full-blown bullets? You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a one of one, you know? what What is the Venn diagram? Someone. Get you someone, a man that can do both. Let it be known. You know what? And I was also thinking this morning, and I already said this this past week, where like there are players that will make their mark in week 10, week 11, or week 12 and carry that through week 17 and week 18 that we aren't even thinking about in this moment. So I, I know I am keeping an open mind to whatever players do pop up here in the next few weeks because as you have trademarked, there are always these post by rookie bumps. There are also players jumping into you know, roles and trends and offensive changes and so on and so forth. So again, we've had, you know, the Amon Ross St. Browns, the Christian Watsons. I love bringing up Tim Hightower. You know, we had D'Angelo Williams lead the NFL in touchdowns, you know, about a decade ago. So uh, again, I just want to stress, and if you have any thoughts on this, random players are going to change the fantasy landscape in your league for you. Unfortunately, this year's version is Taysom Hill. So who <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely talk about here today. All right. We lead with the top 10 teams, the headliners, and then we'll do alphabetical order after that. And we'll kick it off with the Baltimore Ravens. Since the apple of the fantasy football eye ever since this weekend is Keaton Mitchell. He had nine carries on 13 snaps this weekend. Uh, Hayden, before we get into maybe our thoughts on it, let's actually hear from his head coach, Harbaugh. Great. I mean, the guys are so excited for him, you know, and he's a guy that's been just working every day and he, he just, he has a great attitude. He, uh, he, he definitely a very talented guy. I mean, we all knew that you guys knew that you saw him in practice and, and in the preseason games and just finally get an opportunity at this point in time, mid season already, he finally gets a chance and uh, makes the most of it. So it's, it's a guy that uh, we, we were talking about making sure he, you know, got some chances and got some touches. It was something we were all hoping would happen. And uh, I, I thought Todd did a good job of, of making sure it did happen. And then to see him take off like that, I mean, you couldn't have predicted that. Like you said, between the tackles, breaking tackles, those kind of things, that was really great. So nine carries, 138 yards, one score. I remember just a couple weeks ago against the Detroit Lions, he got his first touch of the season on this, like, really cool misdirection play. What did you see when you were watching Keaton Mitchell? So to me, he's just been a guy that's super explosive and jitterbuggy in my pre-draft pro prospect profile of him. I said that he would like be the number one flag football type of player, mm -hmm. and he actually broke more tackles than I was expecting with totally. that. I will say the reason why he was undrafted is because he's very tiny. Now, this has been short King summer, and we've seen A-Chan and other running backs of this magnitude have popped off, but we're playing fantasy football and is this guy going to steal Gus bus workload near the goal line? I don't think so. So I think he's competing with Justice Hill. Now, will they trust Keaton Mitchell in a passing down role versus somebody like Justice Hill with a bunch of experience? I don't think so. But his play has earned him some work. So I think what we're, what we're going to happen here is this is going to turn into a three down Ooh. rotation. And we had Gus Bus. He had his five touches, two of them for touchdowns. He had a 42-yard uh, run as well. He got iced at halftime. Keaton Mitchell and Justice Hill closed this game out. So, sure, you can pick him up. I have very low expectations of him mattering in fantasy, but I do like his tape. I love that we open the show by you just crushing people's dreams and maybe their expectations a little bit. Um I think the most optimistic view of Keaton Mitchell is that he just totally overtakes Justice Hill. And I think that may be in the range of outcomes because Justice Hill, especially after all the injuries that we've seen with him and what we have seen this year, there have been a couple moments, but he's he's just a guy at this point. And to me, what we saw from Keaton Mitchell, especially those later runs that we saw, like this is 
not Devon Achan, Achan level speed, but it's close to it. It's almost Jaleel McLaughlin level speed where he is ruining like Jamal Adams angles and like corners that are trying to keep up with him on those long runs aren't able to catch up to him. And, and as you said, I love the patience that he showed behind the line of scrimmage. Like he was putting his hand on offensive linemen, you know, working between gaps and cutting off of them. It wasn't just, Hey, I'm going to run to the back of them and that's it. So I think we're all looking for like explosive players because they're fun and those plays pop. But I want to refer to what Hayden said, where Gus Edwards right now has 13 carries from inside of the 10 yard line and seven touchdowns. He has eight carries from inside the five yard line and has six touchdowns off of those. Gus Edwards, as you have said, is 2023 Jamal Williams. And I don't think that this team is immediately going to pivot over to that. So is Keaton Mitchell explosive? Yes. Is he probably going to have to live off explosive plays? Yes. Can that happen? For sure. But is that going to be, to me, as consistent as what we know the role that Gus Edwards is going to do on a good offense that has led to 21, 28, and 17 fantasy points over the last three games? Probably not. Yeah, I think you can kind of frame this maybe as like sell Gus Bus if people are trying to value him as an RB1 because he's just been really lucky at the uh, goal line roll. But I will say that 42 yard run he had was one of the best of the entire week. So, like, just because. Keaton and Gus Edwards, had, you're talking about Gus Edwards, yeah, 42 yard run. Gus, Gus's 42 yard run was sensational. So, I don't think they're going to go benching him. I had one other note on this team, though, and that's just the rotation at wide receiver and what that's meant for Zay Flowers. Right now, the Ravens, because their ground game has been so lethal, we got Lamar scrambles, we got Lamar designed runs. Obviously, these running backs are popping up out of nowhere. The Ravens are now 27th in wide receiver usage this last month, and that's really hit Zay Flowers in particular. Zay Flowers now down to the wide receiver 49 on wide receiver 52 usage this month. They got Odell a cheap touchdown with backup quarterback just for vibes, um, but it's been all Mark Andrews in the ground game. And even Lamar Jackson's not getting home. So I think that Lamar right. Jackson's going to get home before Zay Flowers does. So I think we need to stop pretending that Zay Flowers is some like wide receiver two, three fringe guy. Like 30 of his like uh, targets this year, or so, like 18 to 30, so I forget the exact stat, have been screens. Like he's not winning these usual routes. And I have some concerns with Zay. He has zero week to week consistency is how I would like. He's almost an or player and not an and player. Like it's not Mark Andrews and Zay Flowers. Mm -hmm. It's Mark Andrews. And then it's either or Gus Edwards or Keaton Mitchell mm -hmm. or Zay Flowers. Like which of those players is going to get the touchdown or the explosive play. And sometimes it could be or Lamar Jackson. He has yeah. two touchdowns and 80 rushing yards too. I actually do want to bring up Lamar Jackson for a moment. I think it's just a really awful run out. And sometimes this happens when a team scores 37 points and the quarterback in Lamar Jackson only gets 11.5. I think that would be easier to swallow if the previous week he had his 33 or 34 mm -hmm. point game. But then the previous week was just 12 points on top of that. And then, you know, in week six, it was 18. So Right now, he's been about the quarterback nine over the last four games. And I think people are frustrated by that with Lamar Jackson again, especially after seeing a team score 37 and you draft this guy early. I think it's just handing the ball off to Gus at the goal line. That's been the difference. Uh, one last thing. I created these density charts, and this is where the best quarterbacks in the league are throwing the ball. Lamar Jackson's down here. And you can just see that his density chart is just more spread out than everyone else. Like every blade of grass right now, you're seeing some of these deep targets as well. These over the middle throws compared to like players like Burrow and Lawrence the, and even Mahomes, the deep middle part of the field and the sideline throws have been there for Lamar Jackson. In addition to all the stuff that he brings on the ground. And that's why a lot of analysts, and I think it's totally fair think that the Ravens are the best team in football right now. Their defense is absurd. And Lamar Jackson, even though he's not getting home in fantasy, he is has full command of this offense. There were long stretches under Greg Roman where they were not attacking downfield and outside the numbers. And we have seen that at times yep. with uh, with Todd Monken for sure. Final note, for 5077, which means 5 foot 7 inches and 7 eighths of an inch and 186 pounds, Keaton Mitchell does look bigger than that on the mm -hmm. field. Um, yep. But... Height and weight-wise, uh, short King somewhere I have to live on if he is going to get short yardage touchdowns. Okay, Detroit Lions. 
We don't typically include teams coming out of a buy in this top 10 headliner section, but I do want to quickly go over to Dan Campbell and his thoughts on how they're going to handle the Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery situation moving forward. Do you get David Montgomery back this week? What's the plan with Gibbs? Does it go back to where it was, or maybe have you gained a little bit more trust in Gibbs where maybe it's more of like a 50-50? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly we know what, what David can do, um, but but we know that Gibbs has gotten better every week. So um, we're going to ask those guys to do things they do well and that, that help our offense move the football. So, um, you know, I don't think – necessarily sitting here talking to you right now that I see Gibbs getting 65 plays. You know, I don't see that, but he's he's going to get his fair share now. We know what he can be, and he's growing. Um, so I think it, it'll be a little bit by committee and, and uh, make sure we get those guys' touches. You know, Gibbs will get his touches. That was from our buddy uh, Coach Speak Index. Go and follow him on Twitter. Quickly, I want to bring this up, Hayden, because Jameer Gibbs, week 7, 23 fantasy points. Week 8, 27.4 fantasy points. Um, for the people that drafted him, they finally got to latch onto something while David Montgomery was out. How are you interpreting the words that Dan Campbell just said? Well, Dan Campbell is extremely honest with us, and I am just taking what he said for granted. Uh, Jameer Gibbs was averaging 9.4 expected points with David Montgomery. That went up to 17.9, so basically doubled his snaps, volume, production, all of that stuff. I think it'll be somewhere in the middle, and I think it'll be fairly similar to Jamal Williams last year and DeAndre Swift last year, except I think both of these players are better than the versions that the Lions had last year. The Lions have been their number one or number two in expected uh, fantasy points from the running backs last year. Their top five this last month, they were number one not too long ago with David Montgomery. So I think both of them are rock solid top 20 picks. And I think that depending on the game script is how I'll rank which one ahead of the other. But I think that Dan Campbell's right. Gibbs has earned more touches than he did yep. earlier in the season, but at the goal line, it will certainly be David Montgomery. We'll see if Gibbs uh, could earn enough targets in pass protection role and all that type of stuff. I think that's what's going to actually unlock him. But I think probably David Montgomery running back 10, Gibbs running back 14, somewhere in that kind of range is how I'm going to look at this every single week. I think the note, and this is exactly what you and I said going into their bye week, where it wasn't going to go back to what it was to start the year. When, to remind people, Dave Montgomery had 21 carries, 16 carries, 32 carries, and 19 carries. Um, because what we have seen through Jameer Gibbs' stat line over the last couple weeks, 11 carries and then 26 carries, he has earned more, just as Dan Campbell said, because he is showing the competency between the tackles. He is showing that he is not just going to go down on first contact. And now he is probably doing the things on those inside runs that they can trust him a little bit more. I will say they probably will still lean more towards the edge outside stuff, maybe getting him going in the passing game. But as you said, this is one of those players who is hyper explosive, as we saw, you know, against that Baltimore in that Baltimore game, it was a complete blowout, but really the Raiders game is the one that's even more on my radar yeah. that, you know, a carry between the twenties can equal a touchdown for him, but I'm still going to value Dave Montgomery highly because he will rarely have the same type of explosive play in between the twenties. And what is probably even more valuable for him are those again, short yardage runs inside the 10 yard line because those are the most likely for him to score on and he's going to still keep that 100 percent. and i think the next wave of this is the lions have been in the middle and neutral pass rate this month without david montgomery i can see the lions becoming very run heavy i think that some of these jameer gibbs touches are going to come at the expense of guys like josh reynolds uh, maybe a little bit of sam laporta love a little bit of the monroe stuff takes one tick down if they do go back to this really hammer offense and on top of that it's not just david montgomery returning two interior offensive linemen should be healthy back for detroit as well question could both players average double digit fantasy points per game right now for sure for sure okay like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting that actually because the reason i ask is weeks one through five when dave montgomery was healthy he was the running back five overall in points per game. Then if we look at weeks, you know, seven and eight, Jameer Gibbs was the number one running back in fantasy points per game overall. So there's going to be huge expectations on both ends of that.
anything you want to say about Amon Rossi Brown and whoever else and Donovan Peoples Jones, who that might be on my radar just a little bit. I think that is a Marvin Jones replacement, obviously, mm -hmm. as he shockingly retired. Uh, but it might be a bit of a leap for him to replace someone like um, like uh, Josh Reynolds. I think Jamison, DPJ, Josh Reynolds, they're out of our fantasy lives. It's just okay. Laporta and Amon Ra. And, I, and I, there are splits between Amon Ra and Laporta with and without David Montgomery. And that's why I wanted to bring up that neutral pass rate. Like we can see this team being one of the run heaviest in the league. Arizona Cardinals. Kyler Murray is officially back based on an announcement from the team. How are you adjusting? Well, I think it's obviously great news for Trey McBride and Marquise Brown in particular. There's a chance that James Conner returns as well. I think the Cardinals are not tanking. They are trying to win football games right now. And they're trying to see what they have with Kyler Murray. I don't think that we'll get the same rushing production out of Kyler Murray. Typically, that takes a full year before these rushing quarterbacks actually run around a little bit more. We've seen that with Joe Burrow and Dak Prescott uh, recently as well. And sometimes it doesn't return all the way. So that's my concern with Kyler Murray. He's going to have to do some more under center stuff. It's a completely different offense. So it's going to be interesting to see how it works. I wouldn't be surprised if it's not super smooth, but I think that we can at least get to the Dobbs production versus what Clayton Toon dropped out of there. So I would make sure to keep Trey McBride. I know he he was a bust last week because of the system, but he still had 20% targets. And I think that 20% targets with Kyler Murray means that Trey McBride, who's the tight end 11 in usage this month, could actually be a tight end one the rest of the year. Really excited for Hollywood Brown the, the rest yes. of the way. From our buddy uh, Jared Smola here, Marquise Brown averaged 7.5 targets when he played with DeAndre Hopkins last year in eight games without DeAndre Hopkins. Again, this is back in 2022. Um, he had 9.6 targets over six catches, a nice 69 yards, and nearly half a touchdown per game. And we have seen that Hollywood Brown looks good, passes the eye test this year. And even with a new play caller in Drew Petzing, seems to have a bunch of of first read targets on top of that. And we just obviously get hopefully the best quarterback play that Marquise Brown has had this season. Yeah, big time. He, I mean, he he was like a wide receiver two in usage for and we, we are searching season. for stable wide receiver twos. Right. I think Hollywood Brown probably enters that equation for us. I, I think so as well. Uh the James Connor quote was that quote, he's doing well. We'll ramp him up, see how he does. Hopefully we'll get him out there too. So I maybe if trading for James Conner, I wouldn't rule that out. This team's trying to win. So like yeah. that means James Conner's getting touches. Marquise Brown's getting touches and Kyler Murray will be throwing the ball all over the yard. Buffalo bills. After we sit here week after week, Hayden and try and do our best to convince the people that Gabriel Davis is not unlike any other wide receiver out there and how he is just as stable as a bunch of wide receiver twos and yeah. threes out there. He bottoms out. I will add, it was just about the worst possible run out that Gabriel Davis had from like a play in and play out standpoint. Uh, the Josh Allen rushing touchdown was on a pass play designed to go to Gabriel Davis. The interception that Josh Allen threw was a target intended for Gabriel mm -hmm. Davis. Uh, the awful intentional grounding penalty that was called by the officials was an option route to Gabriel Davis. But to me, Hayden, I think most of all, we didn't see the exact same usage that we were hoping to translate from week mm -hmm. eight over into week nine. And on top of that, there was also a ball into the end zone that Gabe Davis could not win as well. Uh, I'm with you. There was not, the spread concept, easy RPO looks were just taken away, but I wanted to give a lot of credit to Luana Rumo. This was that interception. It's, look, it's a drop eight, throws that ball tightly to the sideline, and that's an interception. You can see how much drop eight they were using, how complicated the pre-snap to post-snaps look were. And Josh Allen was doing a lot of this. His time to throw was really high because he's holding onto the ball to the sidelines like this. There were so many different looks that the Bengals were throwing at him. And Josh Allen, to me, never looked comfortable. And it was very similar to how it was uh, in the playoff game. Even this trick play, double teams up top, double teams on the leak pattern. They had everything mapped out on this one. So it, this was just a really well-coached Bengals team and why Luana Rumo is going to be a head coach next year. But Josh Allen needs to be able to figure out this defense because these two teams easily could uh, uh, see each other in playoffs. Real quick, last one, Josh, just because this one really caught my eye. This was the RPO look that we saw the previous week where this would be a throw up to the top. 
watch Chris Hubbard, who's the defensive end at the top right here. He drops out, plays, he gets in the RPO lane, and then comes up, spies Josh Allen, and makes a play on it. So these are the type of wrinkles that most defensive coordinators don't have in their bag, but this is a very smart defense, and they got the best out of Josh Allen once again. Yeah, and again, everyone out there, we are going to continue to play Gabe Davis because that's what we do. We play for upside. We were hoping that there was going to be some stability week on week. Uh, he also is not going to face a Lou and Rumo defense every mm -hmm. single week as well. So there will be better days. Uh, I did want to bring up this running game, Hayden, because as we opened, you know, for the first five or six weeks of the season, it felt like that there had been a change in just overall running back usage for this team. I feel like now they're probably among and back to the league lowest. There they are back in week six through nine. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> These reverts yeah. back to 2022 all over again. Right. And there's a chance that they activate Lenny Fournette and this becomes a three back rotation. So the James Cook stuff is really bad right now. He's the RB 35 in usage this last month. Four of his last five games have been under 10 expected fantasy points. Uh, Latavius Murray hasn't been able to do anything really like the, the true winner here is one when everything was going bad, the end of the game, Steph Diggs makes two plays, fantastic plays in isolated coverage, man on man, uh, gets landed on by a 300 pound security guard, uh, which was kind of terrifying to see that. But the other winner was Dalton Kincaid. Huge. He's up to the tight end four in production, tight end four in usage this month. Only a couple of those games are with uh, without Knox. He is going to be sitting in zone coverage. He has a great yards after the catch feel. And as soon as I tweeted, it, tweeted that out, of course, he fumbled it. Removing that fumble, he does have the sauce after the catch, and I think they'll certainly need him. I remember doing our pre-draft evaluation video that people can go and check out on the channel, and I compared his yards after catch awareness to almost JSN-like, because in the same draft class, where it's this roll, as soon as they catch it, they're just immediately turning up the field. There's no wasted movement. There's no hesitation. They kind of, the momentum carries them up the field. And I'm totally with you. He showed that. And yeah, he's tied, I think, for the tight end five in mm -hmm. points per game right now this month. That is, and we'll get to in a moment, Taysom Hill in week six through nine as a tight end one overall with 16 points per game. Travis hit. Kelsey at 14.6, Mark Andrews at 13.4, TJ Hawkinson at 12.6, and then Dalton Schultz and the Dalton Kincaid at 12.5. What a list of tight ends, <laughs> man. Okay. We'll keep it moving. Now over to the Minnesota Vikings. I mean, just a chaotic, fun week. Producer Weaves throw up these Josh Dobbs highlights, lowlights. Everything in between on, you know, the Sunday night instant reaction show, we ran through all the quotes of what was going to happen here. I mean, Hayden, you can, and people might pinpoint some of the negative plays here because there were a number of them, but just the overall ability to step in and even make things happen and obviously mm -hmm. lead this team to victory should just be applauded in general. And now that we have at least a week of practice here for Joshua Dobbs. He's going to keep people afloat, and that's all we can ask for. Complete legendary performance. His scrambling ability was obviously the difference maker and why they won the game, but even his ability just to make some of these throws down the sideline over the middle uh, was just awesome. He's just so polished, and that's why Kevin O'Connell loves him. Uh, so, yeah, I'm with you. It doesn't seem like we're going to get Justin Jefferson back in this game. Unfortunately, we did lose KJ Osborne to a concussion, so it's more or less just Jordan Addison and TJ Hawkinson going back to Arizona. TJ Hawkinson is possibly set up because Josh Dobbs was throwing the ball to his tight ends a ton. And he actually had a season high in usage this last week, uh, obviously operating in some check down spots here. So a uh, real nice spot for both Hawkinson and Addison this week. I trust Dobbs to keep these boys afloat. And I think that Kevin O'Connell is going to be more aggressive than what Arizona was doing just because this ground game to me is still pretty hit and miss. Maybe a ridiculous take. Does this make Brandon Powell worth a possible pickup because he's going to be playing a lot? I don't have any Brandon Powell takes. I okay. mean, it's, it's possible. He's been the wide receiver 57 in usage. Um, yeah, well, I don't say know. No right there. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I mean, he's going to be playing a lot is, he is will be. why I ask. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, with Josh Dobbs, the athleticism, like you said, is absolutely apparent. 
and just the mobility, it can be a negative like we saw with a fumble and obviously safety was taken, but then it also created a ton of plays on top right. of that. So there's going to be some high variance nature to this, mm -hmm. but we can sift through that. And as you said, TJ Hawkinson actually saw a 35% first three targets in week nine, the highest among all tight ends uh, across the league. So I I'm just glad that we don't have to sit through, hey, Jordan Addison has this, you know, near record breaking start in terms of touchdowns scored in the opening eight weeks of a rookie season. And then that just whittles away. It doesn't. Now we get mm -hmm. it back. Um, and we al we've also gotten Adam Schefter saying that uh, Justin Jefferson will not come back the first week that he is eligible to, which yep. we kind of alluded to on here on the show. It's still a pretty interesting situation. I will say the the Dobbs, the the vibes around the Dobbs win yeah, yeah, yeah. feels like that makes Jefferson has to return this season. So we at least have that. Cam Akers out with another Achilles injury. Uh, I mean, just brutal. This now likely brings us back to the full on Alexander Madison show again. Um, I do wonder, and maybe this is just bias speaking, if they do mix in Ty Chandler just a little bit because we had actually seen that in like a game or two ago mm -hmm. then in the four games without acres, he was averaging 12 half PPR points, which is like RB two numbers. It took a lot of workload to get there. Maybe they go sign miles Gaskin off the practice squad again here as well, but I'm with you. Uh, they, they obviously don't trust Ty Chandler or miles Gander. That's why they made a move for cam Akers. So I think it's gonna be tough though, because I think Dobbs is very live to rush these things in by himself, you know? So I, I well, Madison, I think he's going to be fine as an RB two just because of the volume, but uh, I'm not like super stoked at this point either. And I still don't think Madison has a rushing touchdown on the season. He obviously has two receiving right. ones. And so. that long play was kind of a busted coverage and the break caught that pass down the sideline. Houston Texans episode of scheme out there on the channel right now. Colt McCoy, 31 minutes of goodness going through incredible CJ Stroud throws and coinciding with perfect play calling by Bobby yep. Slowick. Um, I mean, just the formations, the personnel, the diagrams, all of it. It's so good. Um, we did see a pretty significant change here, I felt, in Bobby Slowick for this game. Now, it's against Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They have Vita Vea. Um, first, I tweeted this out during the fourth quarter, excuse me, the first quarter. There's 14.03 left in the second quarter, and Bobby Slowick needs to abandon every first down run. Uh, as our buddy Rich Rebar points out, uh, Devin Singletary had four first down runs. They equaled a total of one yard. And then, Hayden, to go back to your chart, what we saw right after that is first down passes. CJ Stroud ended up being 16 of 19 for 298 Ooh. yards and four touchdowns, including, I mean, just unreal throws that 75 yarder to Noah Brown, which is an unreal block by Tank Dell. So I guess my question is, one, is Bobby Sloat going to carry this over to the next week? Two, was it going into the gameplay matchup specific? Because I don't think it was in the first quarter. Or three, was this just learning on the fly after it was unsuccessful once again in the first quarter? And then it was successful passing the ball on first downs in quarters two through four. And so maybe that carries over into the future. It was the first time they completely abandoned the run. So that's giving me some hope, and the results could not have been better, obviously. So I am optimistic that the Texans become maybe not pass-heavy, but balanced because they were extremely run-heavy, uh, like the Ravens and some of these like really run-first teams to start this season. Uh, but, I mean, Stroud deserves, like, to throw the ball as many times as as he wants. There was, like, some inkling that they – that Slovak told – um, CJ Stroud that he needs to be special this week and we really need you. So maybe that was game plan specific. Obviously the Buccaneers are a pass funnel. Um, but I mean, to me, it's like everyone knows CJ Stroud's a dude and the Texans ground game doesn't matter if it's Singletary Pierce. It doesn't matter. They can't move the ball at all. So just pass the ball like crazy. And if we do get all of that, Dalton Schultz has a chance to be a borderline top five uh, tight end. He's been the tight end five in production, tight end six in usage this last month and i think that we saw big games from tank dell obviously it was a season high for him that double move for that uh ball in the end zone was fantastic nico collins still gets an isolated touchdown over there noah brown's popping up in here as well so i really just want this to be the let stroud cook offense 
Uh, I don't think we should expect that, but I am optimistic that it does happen. Because it's everyone's focusing, I think, on this past week and then forgetting about what we saw the the week before where it was 140 total passing yards and the team put up 13 points. And then obviously in week nine, you get 39 points. They did throw the ball a lot more. Uh, now they get the defense we were just talking about at the top of the show, Hayden, and Lou and Aromo, Cincinnati Bengals. So it's, you know, going from one Todd Bowles, who's been eviscerated and sliced up in recent weeks, to now Lou Anarumo and his defense playing at a really high level. I mean, they should. And I think maybe what gives them more confidence to do that is this patchwork reshuffled offensive line now playing at a really high level in the passing game. They still can't block worth a shit in the running game. But in the passing game, they were outstanding Mm -hmm. this past week. Uh, 3.35 second time to throw for CJ Stroud while also including just seven pressures on the quarterback. Those are unreal numbers and like credit to again, Titus Howard moving from right tackle now playing what left guard and Shaq Mm -hmm. Mason coming back and George Fant playing right tackle. And what stood out to me in this conversation with Colt and we didn't have time to include it in the scheme episode as much as we should have was I think when I do when fans sit at home, they think about explosive and great passing games. It's like, man, there's four or five pass catchers out there in routes. And, oh, we just, you know, find little pockets and have so many targets out there in the field. Instead, so many of their explosive plays had seven or eight man protections. And it was one or two man routes or two to three man routes Mm -hmm. down the field. And so that is, again, allowing CJ Stroud to sit there back there in a comfortable situation and just have pinpoint accuracy and also understanding, hey, these route combinations are going to beat Todd Bowles' coverages on first and second down. And we have two different wide receivers now. Tank Dell is obviously the faster player, get downfield a bunch. And then Nico Collins is doing a lot of the in-breaking route stuff to a lot of success. And the Dalton Schultz is sitting down underneath. So it's like a great three different level passing attack with three different types of players. And then credit to the offensive line and to CJ Stroud, always taking the more aggressive throw, which has been paying off uh, like wonders. It's been huge. Okay, let's keep it moving. Now over to the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, another week, Hayden. Another time that we mentioned that Tony Pollard has not scored since week one. I don't I don't have anything to say about Tony Pollard. If he scores a touchdown, awesome. If he doesn't, then it, <laughs> I think uh, Matt Harmon said it, it, it is what it is. And that, yes. that's all I got with him. John Fox as forever. well, for sure. Um, I thought this was maybe the best CD Lamb game I've ever seen him play. Yeah. It was outrageous stuff the eagles slot corner nickel corner spot is a disaster and cd lamb was absolutely roasting him it was downfield it was after the catch it was a lot of improv improvised throws like that one right there he was just an absolute monster he looks like he has completely taken a step to me they are moving him to the outside a little bit more but it didn't matter if they moved slay inside if they kept him outside it was just absolutely getting cooked and that's been awesome because now CD Lamb is the wide receiver one in usage and production this last month. They're obviously not getting anything out of Gallup or Cooks. It's basically CD Lamb and then Jake Ferguson uh, absolutely roasting everybody. Can we play a game? Uh, because I want to bring up Jake Ferguson, as you just mentioned, and what he has been doing lately. The game that I want to play is what tight ends do you actually want to start right now? Okay. Let's name them. How many can we get to that? Like, yes, I I am happy. I get to start X tight end this week. Okay. Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, Mm -hmm. TJ Hawkinson, Dalton Kincaid, Jake Ferguson. Schultz is in there. Okay. So that's six. Taysom. Taysom Hill. Hell yeah. Taysom. Okay. There's seven. Uh, And then we get into that next conversation where it's like Pitts, Kittles, uh, Laporta. Yep, Laporta. So there's eight. And then Sorry, should, Kittle, by average point. Kittle, Pitts, and Njoku are kind of right in that range as well. Okay, so we basically got to 10. We got yep. to 10 tight ends now in week mm-hmm. 10 that we are happy to start on a weekly basis. That's I a long a way tight. versus where we were in week two, week three, mm-hmm. and week four at the position. I completely agree. It's it's a really good spot. The the Jake Ferguson stuff, just to, to bring his tape up, I mean – Everybody just needs to sit here and watch these clips and tell me if this guy is not an actual dude because his size, 
his after the catch ability, his ability to get out into the flats. And obviously you're going to benefit, uh, be the beneficiary of Dak Prescott, absolutely dicing up defenses, but man, he makes a lot of big boy plays like this one, a lot of hand fighting coming back to the ball and yards after the catch ability. I don't know, man, Jake Ferguson to me looks like a legit tight end. And, uh, he's obviously found the end zone a couple times recently. And that's been the biggest different difference between his recent success versus early on. But I don't know, man. I think that Ferguson might be their second best skill player in miles better than Cooks and Gallup at this point. Yeah, and maybe we can get to 12 with someone like Trey McBride with the Arizona Cardinals that we Mm -hmm. just talked about. So again, I just wanted to stress that we hate the position early on, and it now might be rounding into form uh, halfway through the season, which is great. And a lot of them are late-round tight ends. A lot of them are late-round tight ends. Washington Commanders. So I wanted to bring this up that Sam Howell in the last couple weeks is not taking sacks. And this is important because obviously we talked about in week eight that he wasn't taking sacks because he had like a season low in time to throw, like the quickest time to throw. However, we fast forward into week nine and that 2.54 second time to throw then jumps up to about his season average up to 2.88 seconds. So that is less of quick game and more, hey, we can still attack down the field a little bit more while Mm -hmm. still maintaining lower sacks. That can also be about the Patriots and not having Matt Judon and all those things. But I'm, I'm just trying to... I guess, find a pathway to, hey, Jahan Dotson, Terry McLaurin, and not just fantasy football fluke Sam Howell, who's arguably playing well, arguably not, about an equal amount of time, Mm -hmm. and just being good throughout the rest of the way, if that makes sense. I worry that those were Falcons and Patriots defensive line issues, but we will see. I think he is playing a little bit more comfortable. Jahan Dotson dropped a pass to start this game, and then... Uh, barely was missed downfield, but after that really settled in underneath. And then his touchdown was man coverage, working the seam, a uh, great ball from Sam Howell as well. But we've seen just like this offense, like completely 180 right now. They are second in neutral pass rate uh, over this last month. They are number one in wide receiver fantasy usage. Now with the wow. fantasy usage, they do rotate their wide receivers a little bit more than most teams do because that is a B enemy trait. But Jahan Dotson right now, I do think is a fantasy starter, assuming Curtis Samuel is still going to be sidelined. Jahan Dotson has 12.4 and 10.0 expected fantasy points without Curtis Samuel. And he's now up to the wide receiver 34 in usage this month, including some games with Curtis Samuel in there. So that's mean that's meant bad things for Brian Robinson, who did score a touchdown this last game. But I do think that Terry McLaurin has chances for like really boom weeks. And now Jahan Dotson has entered the wide receiver three boom bust conversation when he was completely irrelevant uh, previously. Totally. Uh, hopefully you all picked up Jahan Dotson and people did drop him after those aggregate after aggravating first mm-hmm. seven weeks because people were frustrated by him because he is has legit talent on the field and it wasn't even close to hitting on the yep. field. I will say um they're facing the Seattle Seahawks. This one is on the road. We know Seah- Seahawks just got diced up in every single direction by the Baltimore Ravens. But to me, that defense is still top half of the league, top 10, maybe even top five. Well, the wide receivers didn't get home. No, no it was everybody not. else. It was everybody else. So it's something uh, to monitor this week. Okay. Miami Dolphins, Hayden. Devon Achan will be back. They are going into their bye week. That should happen in week 11. Obviously, just 14 points this past weekend against the Kansas City Chiefs. Any details you want to bring up for the people? Nothing new. This is not original stuff, but just showing it. Tua lights out to start the season, then faded last year. Lights out to start this season has faded recently. And you can also point to good defenses versus bad defenses as well. Um it's probably mostly noise, but there is a little bit something to figuring out how they're going to stop the brand new wrinkles that we saw in the ground game. That's been, the to me, the big difference here is we haven't seen the explosive runs in recent weeks. Have teams just finally caught up to how to defend those types of runs, how to defend that type of motion? We'll have to see, but when they do come out of the bye, uh, it will be H-Hand back in the mix. 
So that will be good news for them because they really haven't gotten anything out of Salman Ahmed or Jeff Wilson. And uh, I think Raheem most are there being smart with him because he's still only playing like 50, 60% of the snaps here. But really, it's just like two has been struggling. The ground game has been struggling. They've been pl playing better defenses recently. And that it's all working against the entire unit. I'm sure as Dolphins fans, they hate it when they hear and they believe it's probably a narrative or an easy way out that like, oh, the Dolphins can't beat good teams. Uh, right now, it's just a fact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like beat one and then people won't say it, you know, like they've lost the Bills. They lost the Eagles and the Chiefs. So like, again, those are Super Bowl contenders. Anyways, we covered that all on the instant reaction show on Sunday night. Well, with HN back, is like Jalen Waddle a sell high? It like interesting define sell high. He's well, dealing with a back injury. He's been very kind of boom bust still, but like you can sell the name potentially. Yeah. I, I don't even know in that wide receiver two category who you would want to trade for. Mm -hmm. I highly doubt someone would want to trade like straight up a wide receiver one for what they think they're going to get out of, out of Jalen Wall, but maybe that's possible. Maybe it is. Um, as we've talked about, it is Tyreek Hill, and then there is one other thing that hits typically. Right. And to open the year, it was the counterpunch of the running game. And while Raheem Mostert, which I looked this up, shockingly, Hayden, he is tied with Jalen Hurts for the most touchdowns inside the five-yard line rushing in the league this year, uh, has 15 carries inside the, the five-yard line, which is the second most across the league. And yes, those touchdowns have really gotten him home. Mm -hmm. uh, the last two weeks, whereas, yeah, Jalen Waddle is much more involved because we hadn't seen those lateral stretch you out and then, boom, split you down the middle rushing game on top of that, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the, the reason why the narrative ex exists is it's a small team. It's down in Miami. Once they play outdoors against better defenses, more physical teams, can they last the entire season? Uh I think I think it's somewhat fair. I'm not I'm not saying that they can't get, get hot though. Like this team yeah, still would be totally. terrifying to see in the playoffs. Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, what AJ Brown is doing right now, mm -hmm. nuts oh stuff from Jacob Gibbs. AJ Brown saw a season high 60% of first read target share in week nine. Uh, that's ludicrous. Now, I think that even shows that when AJ Brown is getting targeted on the first read 60% of the time. Devontae Smith can still get there because he is good. However, we have talked about Devontae Smith quite a bit on the show that if he's not the primary read, then it's not going to be a consistent performance each and every week on top of it. And that split definitely lines up with the Cowboys playing a lot of man coverage and obviously Jalen Hurts right. with A.J. Brown playing the way he is. Why not just stare him down and keep throwing him the ball? So uh, he, he scored 15.7 uh, half PPR points in seven straight games for A.J. Brown. Now with Devontae Smith, he still was not getting targeted last week. Will that change without Dallas Goddard, who's going to miss four to six weeks? He should be ready for the actual NFL playoffs and probably some of the fantasy playoffs. But historically, with Dallas Goddard off the field, Devontae Smith's target rate goes from 18% to 33%. That's based off of this year. We saw Devontae Smith get more targets uh, last season as well. So I think that there's a there should be more room for Devontae Smith to have more consistent performances, but the last couple of weeks just been long touchdowns. It hasn't been like six, seven, eight catches for Devontae Smith in a long time. But without Dallas Goddard, it's not going to go to Julio Jones. I don't think they're going to throw to the running backs, and they come out of their own bye. Jalen Hurts should be healthier, and they face Kansas City, which probably will have a, t uh, a game total of like 52 or something like that. All right, before we go anywhere for the next alphabetical order teams, we've made it 44 minutes into the show, and I have not told you to hit that subscribe button. Please do it. We're in the road to 100,000 subscribers. I cannot go on vacation until we do that. Hashtag get Josh to Jamaica. Subscribe to the channel so I can go get some sun, finally. Yeah, uh, please get some sun. <laughs> <laughs> Atlanta Falcons. We knew they lost 31 to 28 against the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, let's hear from Arthur Smith on the running back usage. As we saw, Bijan Robinson, 11 carries for 51 yards. Tyler Algier, 12 carries for 39 yards and one score. Back like Tyler, who to me is one of the better short yardage goal line backs in the league. The times we put him and Bijan out there. Um, people played it. They rebound. We even beat you on the ball out there. I mean, at the end of the day, we got we to find a way. These aren't excuses. I'm just kind of giving you the, the, 
rationale and the strategy behind it, you got to have your whys while you're doing something. When it doesn't get you the result, okay, what happened? What do you need to do better? Uh, so there's a lot that goes into it. And uh, we have a lot of guys that can make plays. I mean, certainly you saw Tyler Algier take over that fourth quarter yesterday. And that's not a knock on anybody else, but we kind of, you know, the way the game, that, the game went yesterday, and that's why we have a ton of respect for the way Flores operates. And Okay, I want to bring that up because I think people are still searching on ways for Bijan Robinson to score points. The Atlanta Falcons inside the 10-yard line this year, Hayden. Tyler Algier, 10 carries. Desmond Ritter, 5 carries. Cordero Patterson and Bijan, just 2 carries. Kadero Hodge, Johnny Smith, 1 carry a piece. And so this is one of those instances where people can get mad, but basically Arthur Smith is telling you what he is going to do. And he's going to continue to use Tyler Algier over Bijan Robinson inside of the 10 yard line and most likely in the red zone too. Inside the five yard line, it's eight to one in favor of Algier over Bijan. So it's honestly, it was predictable. You yeah. know, like we talked about this before this, the season, um, Bijan's been under 10 or 15 expected half PPR points in seven of his eight healthy games. That's removing that headache game as well. So yeah, they have to either throw him the ball more or he's gonna have to rip off more plays. But also as a reminder, Bijan did fumble. Now it was in a really explosive run that looked really cool up until that fumble. But yeah, it's not a surprise that, that the guy that without the mustache now likes Tyler Algier at the goal line. Honestly, Bijan Robinson in short yardage situations has not been very good this year. It's like at thirty percent now. It's like very hard to detangle the running back production versus the offensive line, which has been a weak spot for Atlanta this year versus last year. But I think that's been like the the big the big story is the offensive line has not been as good. The ground game has not been as good, and then it's always a hit and miss situation with the quarterbacks. Taylor Heineke, I actually did not have a real chance to go back and review this game completely on the Falcons into that. He has already been named the starter for next week. So I think unless he does something awful, he's going to continue to remain the starter of this team. I think doing that in back-to-back -back weeks now alleviates the theory or the excuse that Arthur Smith can use of the concussion test that Desmond right. put out there, if, if that's fair. Um, Drake London miss this game, but then we got, you know, Johnny Smith for the screen, five receptions, 100 yards, and a touchdown. I think Daigle put it well on the instant reaction show on Sunday night, and it's what I've been talking about for years, for years, is the easy stuff is never there for Kyle Pitts. That has just never been a part of this pass-catching philosophy that Arthur Smith has brought to the table. Instead, he uses him as an intermediate and downfield wide receiver, whereas we look at Kate Otten or Dalton Schultz or Ferg Daddy. Ferguson, yeah. where, hey, it's a chip release. Everyone has been run off coverage, and boom, I can catch it for three yards and run for seven. That's just not in this game for Cal Pitts in an Arthur Smith-led offense. And so everything is always difficult, and to me, that leads to much more high-variance games, and that has how he's lived his life so far. And it's not going to change. Uh, do you want to say Johnny Smith was moving? on that screen. The fact that he housed that was pretty impressive to me. So yeah, Bijan running back 25 usage this month that removes the headache game. Yikes. Carolina Panthers. So in the wide receiver tiers and ranking show, I mentioned the splits of Adam Thielen versus man and versus zone. And then those happened, you know, I, I'm not knowledgeable enough to tell you why that is happening, but it I'm is. Theory. Okay, go ahead. I think that Bryce is not confident throwing over the middle once they get into zone coverage and the offensive line has not been holding up long enough for him to actually dice up things. So everything's been super check downy with uh, Bryce. Uh, when facing zone, he has the lowest average depth of target in the NFL at like five yards. And that's been the difference to me. I need to see Bryce take a couple more shots. Obviously the left tackle play has been horrific. The interior offensive line last week was a total mess. They obviously, I wouldn't trust Jonathan Mingo or Terrace Marshall or DJ Chark either, but I do think that there is something to the zone coverage stuff. And it does scare me because it's been a trend for like eight weeks and they're gonna have to figure this thing out because I think more teams are going to play more zone coverage against him. So I watched the entire Bryce Young game and really ironed out my thoughts onto Twitter. But I do think that there is some height issues going on with that. And some of those throws over the middle of the field. 
Yeah, I think so. I think some of them, he has like five really? interceptions over the middle field. I thought the uh, Falcons games was, I think the, both of these throws was crowded pr pressure. The pocket collapses on him and it's hard for him to figure out exactly where, where it is. So uh, it's been something that they're gonna have to iron out. I don't think it's all Bryce's fault. He did scramble a bunch in this one. There were some very key plays that he did make. And I did like that stuff, but it was the zone defense that was completely erased this offense last week. Yeah, see, I mean, I have a different read. I don't think Bryce's height is affecting him throwing over the middle of the field because if we look at passes beyond the line of scrimmage, 50% of them are over the middle of the field. And he's completing 67% of those. Um, I thought at Alabama, he threw well over the middle of the field. I think that is translating to the NFL where it's not short quarterback, can't see, so he's not throwing it to the middle of the field. Now... Do I wish he would take more shots? Totally. Um, who do you want him to take the shots to is right. the thing. Like my big issue with this Panthers team right now is when he gets to the end of his drop, um, it's either Adam Thielen is getting open or no one's getting open. And then when he's forced to ho hold on to the football, that is very hit or miss on if the offensive line is going to hold up. And in a crowded space, is he large enough or strong enough to probably throw it in in a condensed pocket? No. And so then he is forced to scramble. And then in that Texans game, we saw him create these huge chunk explosive gains when throwing on the move. But then also are those times where you also have to throw short? Yes. But I, I, I really do push back on short quarterback can't see over the middle of the field. I mean, this is just one play just to show an example of this, um, just where I think that pocket starts to clap, zone coverage, this second level throw to me is there, right there, and he's just not holding onto the ball, and then it goes to check down, and since the pocket does clap, then he's... Wh 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 making, which one are you looking at? Are you looking at right here. Are you Okay, yeah, so you're looking right at the here. end route. Yes, the wraparound route right there. That, to me, is NFL open. He just does not make it and then kind of panic throw. So it's obviously just one play. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I could I could throw like a dozen course, where he does throw over the middle of the field. No, of course. But I, there's been the interceptions were pocket collapsing, then throw the ball over the middle of the field, and then it gets picked. So that's been the issue. Um, I had one chart that I wanted to bring up just because it just is kind of shocking about this offense. And I think kind of plays into this as well was this is just percentage of throws that are short of the sticks and to the perimeter on third and fourth downs. So like we like to throw beyond the sticks, obviously to pick up first downs on third downs, and then also throwing over the middle of the field is a little bit easier to complete. And the Panthers are by themselves at 50% of their throws on these third and fourth downs are short of the six and underneath. So that to me is somebody that's either not pulling the trigger, the offensive line's a mess or the wide receivers a mess. I think it's probably all of that, but I do want to see Bryce, take a couple more chances, even if they go incomplete, just to see what you got. I mean, as a see what you got, then throwing it into a covered wide receiver with a cornerback in his hip pocket? I think you got to try something because th this ain't working. He, he's dead last against zone coverage and average depth of target. That's, yeah, that's yeah. not good enough. Okay. We also just have two weeks with a totally new play caller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? it's a mess. The whole thing's a mess. Right. And we have one game where I would say he probably did his best in terms of explosive plays down the field. And then this past one was not, this past one was absolutely abysmal. Um, yeah. Uh, again, I, I am with you and obviously what you put out there with the numbers that does not look good, but I also want to say that on third and fourth downs, like if Adam Thielen is the only one who was getting open then, and that is typically over the middle of the field, then if that can be taken away, who are you throwing the football to? And also the Panthers are up there with penalties. They're up there with number one or number two and false starts. They're up there in sacks this season. So these third downs, sure, the sticks. Yeah, third and nine, third and 12, third and 14. Like, of course, you know, when defenses can pin their ears back and get to the quarterback. I'm, I mean, I just think this is a miserable situation to be in. Yeah. And to put it on Bryce Young to me, is um masking over what a miserable situation this is not I, I, I understand you you can yeah. you can put the Colts game out there but there were plenty of other times this season too where um we don't have to look at Bryce's worst game of the season 
No, of course. I mean, this is just the, the game I watched, but this is just like a play where I think like sit there a little bit longer and throw this ball to either Thielen or Hurst. They're both in there and he pulls off of it to go to a check down on the other side and it just doesn't look like I would give Thielen a chance to beat this linebacker or throw that ball to Hayden Hurst over the middle and he just pulls back. So these are the type of plays where it's like just something's a little bit off. I'm not completely blaming Bryce, but the fact is it's not working and I think everyone's to blame. And I think including Bryce Young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I mean, I am telling you that Bryce Young played really bad football this past one. Mm-hmm. But against the Houston Texans, he played really good football. Like, mm-hmm. really good football and elevated his team. Yep. So, like... It, Here's one for you. This is anticipation throw. Bryce right oh, here. He has a lot of them. He, he, he can do it. Yeah. There's too many plays where the ball gets checked down and not thrown to a tight window. Uh, and I would like che- to see him try the that. Check, the check down thing, like, it's not like he has a Justin Herbert, like, low time to throw from last season or, like, 2.4 or 2.55. He is right there when it comes to uh, Lamar Jackson. Uh, he's at, like, 2.88 seconds this year. Like, that is league average, if not just above league average. So, like, there are plenty of times where he is trying to hold on to the football and at the end of his drop, the, what I would love is, and this is probably more against man than it is versus zone, against man at the end of his drop, pausing it and seeing at the who was open down the field. Like oftentimes there is just no one. There is just no one open because there are other plenty of charts that I've seen that, hey, if there's an open receiver and he's throwing to an open player, he is among the highest in the league in completion percentages this year too. And I think we can also say, hey, Adam Thielen, he is getting open of this wide receiver group. And we have seen that he has resurrected his career associated to Bryce Young. And Mm -hmm. so if there are other wide receivers who could get open, then we would also be getting better production just overall. Yep. Completely agree. By the way, follow Wink's tape. It's my secret account where I put threads out because I don't want to jam 100 tweets on the timeline. I have Wink's (laughs) tapes. Go, Go do your own research. I got all the clips I was talking about in there. Sweet. Okay. Chicago Bears. Speaking of quarterbacks, Justin Fields, limited in practice ahead of Thursday. They play those Carolina Panthers. Um, Do you think that Justin Fields is playing? I don't have a good read on this situation. I don't think it's a lock that he does play. He's been limited in practice this week, so that's not a good sign. I mean, he still is throwing thumb. Like, this is a a big deal. So um, I don't think it's a lock that he does play. And we've seen Cole Komet just keep going on touchdown brigades has been absolutely blowing my mind but dj dj moore has been the one that's been hurt the most uh by the downgrade because basically bajan just throws the ball underneath he very yeah. rarely is throwing the ball downfield at all and obviously dj moore was going absolutely bananas on those deep targets so and also with justin fields coming back i believe cleo herbert maybe justin fields coming back cleo herbert is coming off injured reserve as well which throws a wrench in this deontay foreman situation too um, I wonder if they go to two to one as we have seen this team use in the past. But we also need to bring up Cole Komet. We've had that tiny conversation earlier, scored two touchdowns this past week. Mm-hmm. I believe the first one was on his patented leak pattern. Uh, this time it was covered instead of wide open. Um, and then the second one was, yeah, he blocks, 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 throws out of the way and catches it. So good yeah. on Cole Komet for scoring mm-hmm. touchdowns, but those weren't like your typical. Like, hey, let's run route versus man coverage or sit in zone. Like, obviously, leak is a design play to go to the tight end. But he pops up for two scores, which is mm-hmm. great. Yeah, totally does. Just running hot on touchdowns. Obviously, the Bears are 30th in neutral pass rate this last month. That's what we should expect. It. I, I'll also say this. If Fields does come back, like, I'm not expecting him to be the same Fields. Like, you know, like, mm. it's his throwing thumb. <laughs> yeah. Even if he comes back, that's it not is. like he's going to come back and, like, be ready to go. I don't know. It's a big deal. Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, Speaking of people coming back from injuries in a big way, Joe Burrow's uh, mobility was like a huge standout against the Buffalo Bills. I mean, that play where he escaped left to hit T. Higgins on that crossing route. I mean, it was beautiful. It's so good to see. And it totally changes what this Bengals offense was. And, you know, I talked about T. Higgins in previous weeks and. This one, everything was still just at 10 yards, but at least they were getting him going on inside breakers and, again, these crossing routes so he can get up and become a part of this offense. Completely agree on that. I thought thought the Burrow stuff was fantastic mobility-wise, and then we have the same read on T. Higgins. Uh, It's been the big shot plays is what's been missing for this offense. They have been kind of dinking and dunking their way 
through, but Joe Burrow is in complete command at this point. And I think that we should see the Bengals continue to go on a big run here. So uh, it was good to see T Higgins, who's now up to the wide receiver 31 in usage this month, uh, get back. He looks healthy to me. Burrow looks healthy to me. And that unlocks an opportunity to have some spike weeks, but uh, just a lot of throws, check down throws. I shouldn't say check down throws like pre-snap reads, throw the ball to the perimeter stuff, which is means a little bit harder for someone like T Higgins to rip off 50 yard touchdowns. But the way that Burrow's playing, I would not be surprised if Chase, Mixon, and T. Higgins start really popping off right now. I wanted to ask about Jamar Chase's injury. Um, it was a back injury, I believe, mm -hmm. right? Landed uh, on it, yeah. He said, quote, I'm alive. That's the best thing right now. Uh, how vague? It's good that he's alive. I will say that he did fall about six feet from the air right onto his side oblique action. Chris Collinsworth immediately, obviously such a good call by Collinsworth was like, that is going to be extremely painful for this next yeah. week. So I'm assuming they'll fight through it. The NFL has all the drugs that these players need to get on the field. So we will see. I'm assuming we'll see him back. Yeah. And we've seen Jamar Chase play through injuries in the past too. Mm -hmm. uh, just quickly, Joe Mixon. Back-to-back -back games with rushing touchdowns, I believe. They were both out of shotgun as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, blame me, I guess, well, for uh, saying that they shouldn't run out of shotgun anymore. But the fact that Joe Burrow's healthy means there's more yeah. goal and opportunities, and that's all that matters. Joe Mixon, this last month, is up to the RB7 in usage, RB12 in production. I think that he's a fringe RB1. Different offense. Cleveland Browns. So we got Deshaun Watson back into the lineup. What would you see of him? There were a couple big throws down the sideline that Amari Cooper was able to bring down, and that to me showed that his arm strength was totally normal. He still, to me, on these underneath throws, seems like he's not fully understanding of where his players are going to be lined up. And there was one play where he skipped the ball to the sideline, but he actually his foot kind of just collapsed. So I think ultimately, I don't think that his arm is an issue right now. Like the shoulder stuff, I didn't really see anything. I just think like that play, that touchdown right there. If if Amari Cooper, if if the shot, if this doesn't go off of a helmet, this yeah. safety is going to knock Amari Cooper's head off. Yeah. So he's lucky it got bounced up. Exactly, and then obviously to catch it on top of that, the consistency in this offense still doesn't feel great. But I don't think it's because of the arm. I think it's just Deshaun Watson trying to figure things out with Kevin Stefanski. There was one thing I did like though. There were multiple plays to David Njoku that were kind of like screens. Like we've kind of seen this play where there's like three wide receiver blockers on one side. They run David and Joku on the flats. And then it's like basically a screen, but a pass that's like four yards down the field. I like getting David and Joku the rock, you know, he's an absolute unit out there. Then yeah. Joku's up to tight end eight um, in usage this last month. So that's been like something that I've seen recently where we were complaining about David and Joku's usage. Now I see them actually making an attempt to get at it. So I think Deshaun Watson, Arms fine is his understanding of the offense. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I'm with you. It's not a broken shoulder anymore, but I would say we still are getting like a bit of a mixed bag yes. when it comes to accuracy and placement and those types of things. However, the deep shots, majority of them, very good. And that means Amari Cooper is going to be great for us. Like Amari yes. Cooper this season and the rest of the way is going to be awesome. And I'm so glad we get it. Do you have the chart for their running backs? Because, mm -hmm. um, Again, just going back to ahead of week nine, people nervous about Jerome Ford after getting, you know, just 23 of his 26 snaps in the fourth quarter, so on and so forth. Um, I've landed on, and I talked about this in the instant reaction show on Sunday night, that it's pretty simple. Like between the 20s, this team, I think, views Jerome Ford as their most explosive back and probably their explosive pass catcher on top of that. And then Kareem Hunt is a short yardage goal line inside the five yard line guy. And as Jacob Gibbs, who you should all follow on Twitter, short yard success rate right now, um, Kareem Hunt leads the NFL at 88% while Jerome Ford is dead last at 27%. Completely agree with you. I wish they wouldn't throw Pierre Strong into the mix. They got him for in for a couple of these, but this is like very committee based. They just run the ball a ton. Obviously last week was an extreme because they were up by so many points and it was very clear the Cardinals weren't going to do anything. Uh, but it was Ford in the, the two minute drill. Ford did have a drop, but for the most part looked totally fine to me. Cream Hunt obviously scores the touchdown and that's that. So I think both of them, depending on the matchups, will be 
top 24 and I would rather have Jerome Ford of the two. Um, yeah, I think, I think this team looks functional. I'm not sure if they're great yet. They look functional and their defense is obviously carrying them. Totally carrying them. Okay. Denver Broncos. They're coming out of the bye. What do you want to say? Uh, I'm not sure if there's much I want to see, to be honest. Well, can uh, I, can I throw out this because, please. um, Maybe people are still clamoring for Marvin Mims and Sean Payton is fanning that fire just a little bit. Quote, I'm looking at my notepad and his number on it. We are going to work our tails off to move that needle to get him more involved. Now, we've also seen in the last few weeks, it's felt like that, hey, let's keep Russell Wilson to 25 to 30 passing attempts and run the football a lot. Um and so even if Marvin Mims does play more, which I don't even take Sean Payton's word for it, that he is going to, even if it being a post by rookie bump, um, he's going to have to live off, obviously, deep production. 29th in neutral pass rate before the bye. So that's that's going to be the problem with this offense. Corlin Sutton's getting it done with touchdowns continuously doing that, but he is the wide receiver 15 usage. Uh, Jerry Judy, 54 in usage. It's been Javante Williams ahead of your guy McLaughlin, but that's because Post they were. Bump. Yeah, it's definitely true. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to expect of this offense. I think I think they're trying to limit it. It's kind of what we said before the season: just limit it. If Javante Williams gets going, cool. If not, we'll see if Judy or Sutton can make plays. And their defense is playing a lot better, and so it should be keeping them into more games, which means more running the football than we were seeing passing uh, when they were forced to do it earlier in the year. Yep. Green Bay Packers. <clears throat> Aaron Jones returned in a big way. Uh, Aaron Jones had 20 carries for 73 yards and a score. Another six targets for 26 yards on top of that. It makes sense because zoom out. There is nothing trustworthy about the Packers offense, about this team in general, other than like when Aaron Jones touches the football, like the wide receivers are chaotic and young. The quarterback is high variance and young. And then you have Aaron Jones who is the steadiest thing that Matt LaFour can call upon season high 20 expected half PPR points his last game. He did have the goal line carry AJ Dillon's more or less been removed from the offense, but I'm with you. They had a lead here. It was pretty clear that Brett Rippon wasn't going to make this much of a ball game. I will say the Packers, it still looked really rough out there. Just yeah. the whole time looked really strange. Uh, so yeah, I think they're going to try to get Aaron Jones as many, uh, touches as they can. I think this team is trying to win and iron this thing out, but I don't trust any of them. Romeo, Christian Watson, Jordan Love, Musgrave, none of them. It was a cool play design to get Musgrave that touchdown, but I don't think you can bank on anybody, especially with Aaron Jones back in the lineup, because we're going to see this offense play slower, even more run heavy, and see if they can figure out this defense, which I, another thing I don't trust about the Packers. Indianapolis Colts. Have we turned the page to 75% Jonathan Taylor? Yeah, that's what we saw last week. Um, super encouraging stuff. He had five targets on top of that. He was the only running back to get a goal line opportunity as well. So he's up to the running back 10 in usage. Zach Moss is a season low in production for him as well. I think that he should go straight to your bench. No longer a flex play after this last game. I think the secondary piece of news here, Josh Downs obviously left. With that knee injury, we've seen wide receivers like Josh Palmer all of a sudden miss multiple games. Save Jones, similar issue with knee injuries. Alec Pierce, we know that he's not going to be, quote, earning targets. So it's Michael Pittman and Jonathan Taylor basically left in this offense. I think it's just going to be strictly those two guys to be relied upon. And I think that both of them are set up very well down the stretch. We're getting into bye weeks again this week. It is four teams and some really good offenses. Kansas City Chiefs, Miami Dolphins, Philadelphia Eagles, Los Angeles Rams. Uh, I am monitoring this Josh Downs news because yes. if he doesn't play, Isaiah McKenzie is going to play. Mm -hmm. Isaiah McKenzie is going to be the starting underneath slot to intermediate wide receiver. And that is a bigger part of this offense than Alec Pierce. I understand Isaiah McKenzie didn't have huge points this past week, but also uh, the Colts had two pick sixes and less than 200 total yards of offense because of it. That wasn't because the Panthers defense in my mind. It's because again, you get two pick sixes and then you don't have to have the ball at all in the third quarter. So Isaiah McKenzie's a bit on my radar as a waiver wire flyer. If uh, people aren't 
mm-hmm. thinking of that, if that makes sense. I think it's possible. Yeah. I, I'm hoping it's just like Michael Pittman becomes a wide receiver one. That's what I would yeah. like. Yeah. Jacksonville Jaguars. They're also coming out of their bye week, Hayden. The question, what do you want to see from them? Um, is Zay back? It's, I think that he was like not practicing again, right? Again? Yeah. Um, we shall see. Uh, if so, that would be... Why didn't they put him on injured reserve? I'm not sure. Uh, the thing that's been like kind of just weird... Oh, no. Me, oh, no. Oh, no. Here's the best what? quote. I mean, this is a brutal quote. When asked about Jaguars injured players, a list that includes Walker Little, Tyson Campbell, Andre Sisko, Doug Pearson said all of them except for Zay are doing well. Yeah. Doesn't sound good. Um, what's been really weird about this team, though, in the last month, their ground game has been terrific. Their defense has been lights out. They are 31st in wide receiver usage per game this last month. 31st. Wow. So, I mean, it's been, we've been seeing Christian Kirk get home. Calvin really's made a couple plays, but it's been a little bit more balanced. Like, they're like dead middle when it comes to neutral pass rate as well. You can see them right here. The Jaguars at 53%. So it's been more Evan Ingram, been more Travis Etienne, and more defensive approach. And the they keep winning games are six and two right now. So that's been a little bit concerning for Ridley and Christian Kirk, I guess. Yeah, I made the connection between Zay Jones and Calvin Ridley on previous episodes of the show. John Chipley has some really cool tweets here. Crazy stat: Zay Jones has played one full game for the Jaguars this year, and still has caught fifty percent of Trevor Lawrence's red zone passing touchdowns. Uh, I don't think you can start the conversation about the Jaguars offense not hitting certain volume numbers without talking about the absence of Zay Jones, both due to what he opens up for Calvin Ridley. Again, many of those routes down the field that are running off coverage um, and his red zone impact. So it's interesting. Could we just put some other wide receiver in this? Pretend Tim Jones? Zay? Yeah, put Tim Jones, pretend he's Zay Jones, and just copy paste. Last thing I had with uh, Jacksonville, looking at this the density chart, the middle of the field for Trevor Lawrence and over the middle is just not there. Like every other elite quarterbacks got a little bit to that, especially CJ Stroud, by the way, but Trevor Lawrence, nothing post routes, dig routes, all that. It's not because Trevor Lawrence can't do it, but they seem to be fine with like just all right, Evan Ingram, check down Christian Kirk, check down Travis Etienne after the catch and after contact. Sure. Um, but a lot of sideline throws for Jacksonville is kind of on my radar. Kansas city chiefs. They put up 21 first half points, no points in third and fourth quarters. We talked about it on Sunday night, how they are 30th in touchdown drives in second half of games right now. Um, I mean, that's then what gets you, you know, 10 pass catchers combining for 20 receptions and 185 yards. I don't even know what to say about this team other than Isaiah Pacheco is the leading receiver. Travis Kelsey should get home each and every week. Rasheed Rice can make one play each week. And beyond that, is there anything left to say? Uh, I, I think you summed it up. It's, yeah. it's crazy that we have the best quarterback I've ever seen. And we have like one and a half players that are fantasy viable. Las Vegas Raiders. Welcome to the Josh Jacobs show. We got it. And I mean, I know people don't like to live on narrative street here a little bit, but you can connect the pieces and could have prior to this game. And I think you did in our running back tier show where you get Antonio Pierce coming in as head coach. You get a rookie quarterback, non first rounder inserted, and you get a guy who was, you know, getting a good amount of volume, but let's lean on him even more in Josh Jacobs. And in this one, 26 carries 98 yards and two scores. His vision is very underrated. Like well. this, this this clip, like it's not a bunch of 50 yard runs. I get it, but his vision and cutback and physicality is still there. And I know Antonio Pierce would love it. There was a couple, obviously the vibes are completely immaculate with the Raiders. All of a sudden, I like there was like this one nugget that Antonio Pierce is getting his practice squad guys on the sideline of games. McDaniels didn't want to do that. These just silly things were driving me nuts. But most importantly for fantasy this week, to nobody's surprise, the Raiders had the highest uh, neutral run rate of the season. It's going to be heavy, heavy, heavy workloads for Josh Jacobs this last last month. Josh Jacobs is RB4 in usage. I think Josh Jacobs is somebody that you should try to trade for. If somebody's feeling nervous by the end of the season, I don't think Antonio Pierce is going to play Zamir White. None of that stuff. He's trying to win. He's trying to become a head coach long-term, and they're going to run the ball 
with Josh Jacobs because they don't want to put it on Aiden O'Connell's lap. So I would not be surprised if Josh Jacobs is bordering on like top five, top six fantasy production down the rest of the season. And nobody at the round two, three turn has been good this year. Josh Jacobs is probably the best pick in that range. Okay, here's a callback. Would you rather have as your wide receiver to Jalen Waddle or your running back to Josh Jacobs? Exactly. Yeah, it's like not even close. So is that is that a move that you are looking to make in your yeah. league is trading away Jalen Waddle for Josh Jacobs? Oh, yeah. I think you'll have to send more than that, though. Well, maybe not in some leagues out there because it's the flashy name on a good offense and the team that just fired their head coach. And, you know, this is what people read into. But I think, like, there's, like, some risk that, like, that he'll get benched in week 16, 17, 18 to see Zemir White. I don't think Antonio Pierce gives two shits about it. Pierce is coaching for the coaching job. And he said that Jacobs is the foundation of the team. Yeah. Now, I will say, the Devontae Adams stuff, it could get really bad. Jacoby Myers, com- I think Jacoby Myers will not be in my top 40 wide receivers this next week. Wow. His target share is way down. Like I just said, they're going to be running the ball as much as they can. I also don't trust Aiden O'Connell. So I think Devontae Adams and Jacoby Myers, certainly they are huge, huge, huge losers with the switch and the quarterback play this year. But Josh Jacobs, I do think is going to be a winner and pot- potentially a league winner. Los Angeles Chargers, I mean, just a brutal run out for yours truly, who took the higher on Austin Eckler's four and a half receptions and then saw like three drops in the opening two quarters of this game. I mean, they were right there. Austin Eckler catches those every single time, yeah, and it didn't happen. Uh, But just speaking of this offense, 84 rushing yards, 136 passing yards. Obviously, they put up 26 points, some, you know, defensive plays and obviously special teams factors into that. But this team is missing Mike Williams and Joshua Palmer so much. And Corey Lindsley on top of it, their center. It's just, it's, it doesn't look very good right now. And the neutral pass rate is down. I think they're going to make Austin Eckler the foundation of this offense like we saw last week. Um, Herbert has not been playing good ball right now on top of it. It's kind of hard to detangle. I use that word way too much. Uh, it's hard to detangle the Jets anemic offense and the Chargers defense playing pretty well of like, do they need to even throw the ball that much? So I think that was playing into it. Turns out though, it's not going to the ball, no matter what, it's not going to quit to Johnston. No, nope. Three targets, two receptions, 14 yards. That might be a season high for him so right. far, but not trying to pile on here. Mm-hmm. Sometimes season usage is wrong. Sometimes preseason usage proves right, but frequently, I saw and even quote tweets if you want to look back on this one from August 28 that Ola BC Johnson, the 2023 version of that was Joshua Palmer. It's very clear that this team knew, despite what Quentin Johnson said this past May of, oh, I've earned the starting job, that this team didn't want him to be a starter, that they knew he was going to take time to develop and they are forcing him to play right now and forcing that entire process to speed up. And currently it's only week 10. It's not really learning on the fly. Like you're just seeing people in his hip pocket all the time. Right now it was sauce Gardner. Very difficult, right. but, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's the negatives that we saw on his college tape is what we're seeing. It's basically a trail and Burks type of season. Uh, other note, Gerald Everett only ran around on 58% of the dropbacks last week. So this is a team where it's Eckler and Keenan and that's it right now, which is shocking because it's the chargers next few weeks. The Lions, who have been mostly good on defense this past week. However, you have outlined how they've been missing a whole bunch of defensive backs Mm -hmm. over the last few weeks. We get the Packers after that, the Chargers, and then it goes in the Ravens. So maybe like two of these next three games that they get, we can get more points from this Chargers team. I would still hold on to Quinton Johnson if you can on your bench just because we can see this thing flip. But I think most likely scenario is he does nothing the rest of the year. But hold on to him just in case I'm wrong. Los Angeles Rams. So first, and I'm, I'll pull them up here. We get these quotes from Sean McVay, and you know me. I mean, I just love these press conferences, love quotes whenever we get it up from, um, whenever we get them from coaches. And at first, it like just reads as if Matthew Stafford is absolutely going to play after the bye week that they have coming up. Quote, feel really good about Matthew and how much he's attacked doing everything in his power to be back and to lead the way for this team. And so we're going to look at a lot of different things over this break, but I'm optimistic that I don't even have to think that's something that we have to worry about in reference to an earlier question of, are they going to stick with Brett Rippon as the starting quarterback? Um, now we know that Brett Rippon has been cut and Carson Wentz has been signed to the team. So we have an entire bye week here. I am still leaning towards Matthew Stafford 
being the starting quarterback of the seaman being healthy enough for it. But the wrench of Carson Wentz being thrown in there, it's either, hey, they're being optimistic publicly, or it's Brett Rippon was awful and we just want a better contingency plan if something does happen. Yeah. And if I say that Justin Fields is playing or is not going to play because of his thumb, I think I should have the same stance with Stafford. It's it's a tough situation. We'll see with the bye week. I, I don't I think it's just that they had dresser win and Brett Ribbon <laughs> as their quarterbacks. And they're like, uh, maybe we should get Carson Wentz in here. Uh sounds like Kyron Williams is going to be back for week 12, too. And so we've seen like this huge 50-50 split just in snaps, not necessarily in volume and opportunities between Daryl Henderson and Royce Freeman uh, in the last few weeks, whereas with Kyron, we saw like 90 to a 100% snap and volume from him. I'll be interested to see if it goes right back to that because Kyron Williams went on the field this year, yeah. has been a top five scoring back in a per-game basis. I don't think Hendo or Freeman's looks very good. I thought Freeman has had some flashes, but Kyron's their best back for sure. Yeah, it certainly sounds like... Um, they're optimistic with uh, with Kyron Williams. Okay, New England Patriots. Hayden, what we got? We've been hoping for it. Explosive Ramondre Stevenson. This first play, just like this little Texas route from Ramondre, just like shows you like how much of a freak of a player he is when things are actually going his way. Obviously, goes untouched on this really long run. Just has to beat the safety and houses it for a big dude. Definitely has. A lot of athleticism. It was nice to also see that he had six targets. I don't think that's a coincidence with the wide receiver group being as bad as it is. He, over the last month of the season, is now up to the RB19 in usage, which is a good start to get him back into the RB2 discussion here. Maybe the Patriots offense looks a little bit better recently than it has previously, but this offense still lacks so much juice. Hunter Henry gets home. Uh, ball after the turnover, scores a touchdown there, season high in usage uh, last week for Hunter Henry. So maybe he's a tight end two streamer. And then if we're going to go PPR scamming, Pop Douglas, 10.8, 8.2 expected half PPR points in his two games without Kendrick Bourne. Uh, the rest of it is bad. I'm not sure if you watched any of the Tyquan Thornton stuff. It was about as bad as wide receiver play can get, really. I know it hasn't been pretty, but in the last four games, Ramondre Stevenson, 15.5. 11.5, 6, and now 21. He is, again, over the last four weeks, averaging the same number of points as Joe Mixon, Saquon Barkley, Jonathan Taylor, Austin Eckler. Now, that's not huge numbers, but that is so much better than we got in the opening five weeks of the season that, hey, maybe it doesn't continue because the Patriots suck. but Or it's, I know he only scored six in week eight, but we talked about on the show, it was the best he had looked running the football and this past weekend, again, we saw the best he has been with the ball in his hands and also getting involved in the passing game equals 21 points for us. And I'm hoping now that the season is officially a full-blown waste that the Zeke Elliott carries and stuff just start going bye-bye. Go to Jamaica, Why? Zeke. Go to Jamaica. Yeah, exactly. Go go tan with Josh. <laughs> Dude, I, I, me, Sierra, and Zeke. And, on the an, of Jamaica. and an SPF 78. <laughs> New Orleans Saints. Um, talked about earlier, Taysom Hill is the highest scoring tight end of the last four weeks. 16 fancy points. And we've seen it in different ways. Like, we saw it a few weeks ago, him catching the football. We've seen it, him being like, really a second ball carrier for this team, which also coincides with Alvin Kamara losing touches yes. on this team too. It's not to, you know, Kendra Miller, who once again is injured with an ankle injury not just J Jamal Williams, it's going to Taysom Hill. Um, and then we've also seen him throw the football too. He's their goal line quarterback, running back, whatever you want to call it. He's not a tight end except for in fantasy, uh, but it's certainly working for him. Yeah, I had the same note about Alvin Kamara though, just because the Saints were mixing in Jamal Williams early in this game. This is uh, the just overtime chart. Jamal Williams first to get the ball here. Jamal Williams continually mixing in. Obviously, Kamara gets a goal line opportunity. He gets a two minute drill stuff. So he's still a totally fine back, but we didn't get Jamal Williams early on right. in the previous games. So um, I do think that maybe we can retire Alvin Kamara from being the RB one uh, for a couple of weeks, probably closer to like a mid or low end RB one. Yeah. And that doesn't even include that chart. What we saw from Taysom, Taysom Hill. Yep. Running the football again. I'll, I'll throw up our guy coach speak index here. 
uh, with some quotes from Dennis Allen, perfect world scenario. Those snaps are getting earned out a little bit, or evened out a little bit, I should say. 17 game season, yada, yada. So basically, we saw Alvin Kamara miss a handful of games to open the year. Maybe they were like, oh, he didn't get touches in this one, so we can overload him. And now they're realizing, okay, we can't give him 25 touches a game. And the Saints like Jamal Williams. They gave him a two-year, like, yeah. next year he's going to be on this team because they gave Jamal Williams a lot of money. So, like, I think that they wanted to get Jamal Williams in a little bit. They can't retire the Taysom Hill stuff because he's their best player somehow. Uh, Chris Olave, uh, he gets home, and I want to claim, like, deep target regression, touchdown regression, all that stuff. All of his targets were underneath, you know? Like, that's just how he got it done this last game. Nothing too flashy. Uh, he's still only the wide receiver 28 uh in points this last month but at least he did score a touchdown this week but it was not the deep targets this week it was a lot of check down stuff new york giants i have uh nothing to say about this team because oh, now tommy devito is a starting quarterback i mean it's saquon barkley running him into the ground like to me if i was saquon i'd be like thank you thank you giants I'm done for this year. You're not going to give me 40 freaking touches. It's insane what they're doing to him. Hand up. I have not followed the status of Tyrod Taylor. Is he like IR. out for three games? IR. Or just IR for the whole season? Ribs, IR. I, I don't know. But it, but at least know, for the next three games, he's out. Right. But like the, the context is this is Tyrod Taylor's ribs, the most famous pair of ribs True. in the entire country. True. So we really do get Tommy DeVito as a starting quarterback for the next three weeks. Or Matt Barkley, or your scheme host, or maybe no, you. no, 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 no. Me, me and Colt are Rocking riding it out for the next season, and then we move from there. Right. This is it's going to be one of the most ludicrous. It might as well be the an Army versus Navy offense. <laughs> Love it. Okay, New York Jets. Um, maybe they should be in that same category too, because Zach Wilson is going to remain the starting quarterback of this team until Aaron Rodgers takes over. They have Tim Boyle and Trevor Simeon. Um, it's like. The worse, the worse that Zach Wilson plays, the more Robert Sala shows optimism in him. And I understand like he's doing that as a coach and thinks he needs to protect his his guy. Right. But as we have previously said, like Zach Wilson went from awful just to purely bad. And <laughs> at least that means he is throwing first three targets to Garrett Wilson, which he still did this past weekend. But because of that, and while the quarterback is still bad. That's going to equal no touchdown scored, bad games for Brees Hall, just a cap ceiling for this offense in general. Gary Wilson, wide receiver three in usage this last See? month, but it's not, he's not a wide receiver one, obviously. And then Brees Hall, I think you summed it up well. He's been getting home because he's such a monster, but it's, it's hard to score 50 yard touchdowns all the time. You know, yeah. like even for even Adrian Peterson was not ripping off 50 yard touchdowns all the time. So it's going to be very inconsistent play for all of them. I would still like to have them versus everybody else, but. Um, I, I just need a prediction from you. Will Aaron Rodgers suit up this year, and how will that go? Like the regular season? Any, like at any point, will we see Aaron Rodgers in a Jets uniform? Totally, we will. M my concern is, and I, I do think quarterback play can improve offensive line play at the same time, but as we saw last year, this isn't just a Jets thing. As we saw with the Packers, Aaron did not want to get hit. It no. was get the ball out quickly or throw it vertically. And... Doing that while on the third snap of the season, your Achilles goes now going behind the offensive line that doesn't have Elijah Vera Tucker that is moving Max Mitchell from right tackle to right guard and playing your boy Billy Turner at right tackle too. And we're seeing the hits that Zach Wilson is taking when he's trying to work to his third progression here. My brain just doesn't know how to formulate and imagine a scenario where Aaron Rodgers is going to be able to sit back there in the pocket and like pick out open receivers on a defense. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I would like to see it, um, but it would be one hell of a story if he's out. And there. also, they got to get there. Like Zach That's Wilson, he's playing right now. Like the defense is still playing unbelievable football, but that is no sure thing. Just relying on your defense week in and week out to make the playoffs. Right now, the Jets' odds of making the playoffs are about plus 300, depending on the book. Like, plus 200 to plus 300. So, they got their work cut out. Pittsburgh Steelers. Deontay Johnson is about the wide receiver 11 since returning off of that bye week. 10.4, 12.5, 8.5, 8.5. 
18 and a half fantasy points. So Hayden, is it as simple as Deontay Johnson is a better wide receiver than George Pickens slash Kenny Pickett likes Deontay Johnson to receive the football more than George Pickens? Uh, yeah, I'll give you both of those. Whatever, whatever you need to be sold on. Uh, Deontay is the wide receiver 10 in usage. George Pickens is averaging about two fewer uh, expected half PPR points with Deontay back in the lineup. Obviously, this last week, George Pickens has not dragged that toe in somehow. Uh, but Deontay Johnson's the easy button in this offense right now. At least the Steelers are moving the chains, you know, like it's not super sexy. I don't think there's gonna be a lot of big plays in this offense, but they're at least moving the chains in the last couple games here. So uh, Deontay, I think it's like, a, depending on the matchup, a top 15 fantasy wide receiver is the, the wide receiver 10 in usage right now. So uh, I, I do think that's believable. But we went all the way back to Canada outside the numbers ball in this one too. It was bad. It was, there's one or two targets the entire game over the middle. I mean, those throws, it's so hard to complete a pass that far down the sideline. And the reward is you get six yards. You know, it's, it's crazy talk. Okay, so um, just, go ahead. Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. I will say Najee Harris looked pretty good last week. It was, and Jalen Warren was even looked better, but like some of these Najee Harris runs, I was like, where, where did these things come from? So that was, I think pretty encouraging for the Steelers. If they can get anything going here, but um, obviously all this stuff can come crashing down and this Titans defense, they have a couple guys on it, but their secondary was a total mess last weekend. Uh, they still only scored what 20 points. So, Najee Harris this year tied for 18th in carries of 10 plus yards. Like that is not something that we typically see from him. I've been quietly having the same theory as you where he like does look a bit more exposed this year. Maybe yes. that's, you know, improved blocking. They spend a first round pick on Broderick Jones. The interior has played a bit better as well. But um, I mean, I understand that's on 122 carry, excuse me, on 100 carries versus Jalen Warren's 56. But they have the same number again of 10 plus yard carries, which I think is notable. Yeah, I just want him to slim down even more. Like, keep slimming down, like Le'Veon said before the season. Like, you don't have to be a 300 touchback. Like, be a more slender 200 touchback, and like, let's see what you got. Just to really piss people off, he has one more 10 plus yard carry than Tony Pollard does on uh, 20 fewer carries a season. Impossible. Imagine saying that you'd be canceled back in August. It's Salem witch that, trials. That Najee Harris would be more explosive this season than Tony Pollard. San Francisco 49ers, just four teams to go, ladies and gentlemen. They are coming out of a bye. I mean, what do you want to see? We're going to sound, sounds like we're going to get Debo Samuel back too. Sounds like Debo's back. Maybe not with Trent Williams. Uh, obviously, we say it every single time, but this offense can't support four superstars. So you're going to have to pick two. One of them is always going to be Christian McCaffrey. So we're basically rotating which wide receiver gets home uh, with both of them back. In the lineup, George Kittle averages five expected fantasy points compared to 9.8 with one of them missing. So we will see. But just like as a reminder of what this team looks like, uh, this is just over the last like month of the season, the freaking 49ers like just don't throw the ball ever. You know, like it's just hard to thread this needle to get all these guys in there. So uh, we shall see. And that'll be even harder without Trent Williams if he's not ready. Seattle Seahawks. Uh, is there anything you can take from a game where you lose what, like 37 to three or whatever it was like it, it is difficult for me to even read into whatever Zach Charbonnet, Kenneth Walker splits people want to put out there, or even like JSN did this and this and this offense this week. Well, I'll, I'll try to try my best, but I'm, I'm with you. That's really hard. Charbonnet did get run early in the game when it wasn't a complete blowout. They did get Charbonnet in the two minute drill. So I do think that there is a difference between Kenneth Walker and, as a huge player in this offense versus him in like a 60 40 kind of split. Um, and Geno Smith does not look as good this year as he did last year. And now there's a third guy in the mix. So I think it's going to be harder for Metcalf Lockett and now JSN to really like be difference makers in fantasy, you know, like it's whoever scores the touchdowns more or less who's going to do it because Gino's just not like throwing up the top 10 numbers that he was last season. So I'm not sure if you saw anything out of JSN really, but if JSN like is a 20 target share type of guy, how is Metcalf and Lockett going to have any consistency at all? Yeah. And again, we did a film breakdown on Shane Waldron's offense. I actually really like it. He does some really cool stuff. Um, 
it was brutal putting that out the week of them playing well, the Baltimore Ravens. There were like 20 it, pressures last week. Right, right. Totally. And, you know, they got their left tackle back in Charles Cross, but then at right tackle, like you said, it's Jason Peters rotating in, and it yeah. was like Stone Forsyth playing at that spot. Right. And we know Gino will hang in the pocket and be super aggressive. I mean, obviously the player um, – a wide receiver that I would trust the most the rest of the way is DK Metcalf on top of that. And I still don't feel like like out of the bye, we did see them incorporating Jackson Smith and Jigba. But if this is an explosive play offense, like JSN has not shown us explosive plays no. on top of that. And that's not really his MO. It's like almost a metronome, a consistency element yeah. to it all. I will add, and again, this incorporates a bunch of when Zach Charbonnet was both a rookie and not playing earlier in the year because he was injured. Kenneth Walker owns 75% of his carries inside the 10-yard line um, at 18 on the season. That is, I think, tied for the second most, excuse me, tied for the fourth most in the NFL this year. Again, we don't have a huge sample in games that he and Zach Charbonnet are combining for these. And as I've talked about, I understand that the Pete Carroll press conference quotes are being passed around with Zach Charbonnet. We agree with them. We love Zach Charbonnet as a player. Ask Pete Carroll about a player. And he's going to talk glowingly about them. And I think he would do the same thing about Kenneth Walker. Yeah, completely agree. Okay, two more teams. Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So I didn't spend enough time on Rashad White on the Sunday show. Um, I think it's because the Houston Texans are on the opposite end. And I was speaking glowingly about CJ Stroud and Bobby Slowick so much. Uh, Rashad White got two touchdowns in the game after having just one entering it. I still think the run blocking for this team is extremely questionable. Um, but over the last three games, Rashad White has gotten far more involved in the receiving game. And we know that he still has a hold on, again, the goal line opportunities for this team too. Yeah, season high in uh, expected fancy points at 23 and a half. That's what happens when they actually get the rock inside the five-yard line. It's just They have not gone down there that that often this year because it's been a lot of big plays like Mike Evans when they have been scoring points. But I'm with you. The, the consistency is not going to be there except Rashad White catches a bunch of these checkdowns. But when I went back and watched this game, he's not perfect, but Baker Mayfield's like, he's a starting level quarterback, like a low end starting quarterback, but he is definitely good enough yeah. to move the move the chains like pretty consistently. And he's fired up out there. So like I get like it was a, a pretty annoying early on with Baker Mayfield and people were like sensationalizing his performances to me. Like I, I think he's totally fine out there. I think he will be moved around. He'll be a starting quarterback next year too. No, I actually think that he's played this way the entire season. He just mm -hmm. ran super hot as we talked mm -hmm. about in that episode with Colt uh, in like the first three games of the season where he wasn't getting sacked. He was converting at a super high rate on third downs Yeah, uh, against pressure. He was unbelievable. Then it flipped to the opposite end where he was among the bottom of the league in those categories as well. Mm -hmm. But I'm with you. Like they are super vanilla on first and second down. And it's like, Hey, based on the coverage, throw it to Mike Evans or throw it to Chris Godwin. Or if you want to check it down on a check and release to Kate Otten over the middle of the field or throw it out to Rashad white, that works. And then on third downs, they do some cool stuff. You know, yeah. I think the pass pro for this offensive line is much better than the run blocking. Yeah. And that's why with Rashad white, you see a couple of those explosive plays, but then there's plenty of others where it's like a loss of two, a loss of one, a gain of one, a gain of two over and over and over again. Yeah. There's some times where they just like completely give up on the run. Yeah. Okay. Tennessee Titans. We close with. Will Levis, he's been named the starter for the rest of the season. From a pure entertainment standpoint, this is thrilling, and it's great for his development. I mean, this is the opportunity for a second-round pick that every team passed over in the first round to earn the starting job for the next three seasons on his rookie contract. Can't wait to watch him play. The splits I'm kind of taking note on is – the Titans have been a little bit more run heavy with Will Levis, which is to me, no surprise, especially if they're going to want to set up play action, deep bombs to him, his charts, just spraying the ball down the field constantly. So I think it'll be very inconsistent play from him, but it is certainly fun to watch. And I think it's the right move to see what they got with Will Levis out there. It goes back to the off season though. Like why didn't the Falcons and the Titans make a trade for Ryan Tannehill? It seems like that would have been very beneficial for both parties here, but glad they went with it. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins is going to be a, I think, pretty volatile like wide receiver three, but he now has paths to upside just because Will Levis, we know what he's going to do. And then 
hopefully Traylon Burks is doing better now. That was pretty scary uh, from him last week. Probably going to miss this next game, I would, I would guess, just based off how bad that looked. Um, but when he was out there, he, I mean, DeAndre Hopkins is like five times more targets when both of them are on the field. So not good for Traylon Burks. Long term, it'll be Derrick Henry and DeAndre Hopkins and then Chig dropping passes over the middle. Next two weeks, both on the road for the Titans against the Buccaneers and the Jaguars. We talked about the Buccaneers defense being sliced up in recent weeks as Todd mm. Bowles. Uh, I mean, especially in the red zone, they're running a bunch of quarters and just take that Bobby Sloat game plan and try to copy it on here. And then the Jaguars defense, I think, is one of the more underrated units across the league. Um, it is funny when you search just by intended air yards per attempt, the top two names, Ryan Tannehill and Will Levis. So it is, I mean, off deep play action. Yeah. They want to throw the ball down the field. Uh, again, he can rip it, Will Levis. And I just want to see, I mean, this offensive line, they got totally injured against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and right. the Steelers also have TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith. And if they can hold up a bit more, just like seeing the internal clock being correct for Will Levis while still unleashing these deep bombs down the field mm -hmm. and then minimizing the stakes, that's kind of what is on my radar the rest of the year more touch than I was expecting from Will Levis, yeah. which has been nice Thro uh, throwing some second level passes on there. To me, it's where is he at pre-snap and post-snap? I think some defenses will fool him at times, but at worst case, we have some deep bombs and I'm here for it. Okay, that does it. Hour and 45 minutes. We're out of here. Um, as you know, there's already an episode of Scheme out there on the artistry behind CJ Stroud's record-setting performance, 400 plus yards, five touchdowns. Uh, I think every single quarterback in the NFL right now that has thrown for 200 passes uh, has at least three interceptions. He just has one. So as you know, Hayden, one of my favorite phrases is like progression is not linear. Like you can go, especially with rookies, like you go awesome plays, miserable plays, good, solid, bad, blah, blah, blah. What we're seeing from CJ Stroud is like, we're stacking good stuff. We'll take out that Panthers game last week where he threw for 140 yards, but like it's all in the positive angle. And uh, go watch that. And then we'll also have running back tiers, quarterback tight end tiers, wide receiver tiers over the next three days as well. What is your reaction to Martavis Bryant signing a contract with the Dallas Cowboys? I mean, that's wild. That's wild. I thought we had his replacement of his stylings and Christian Watson in the NFL. Right. And uh, now he gets, he's only still 29. Is that right? I think he's 31. I think he got, I think he got <laughs> that cool. That was a joke. That was a, that was a great delivery, but it was a joke. <laughs> okay, good. I thought, I thought you got fooled by somebody else. No, no, no. He's, he's a forever 29-year-old. Yeah, that's facts. <laughs> Love that. All right, everyone. Thank you so much, and thank you to Producer Weaves. Uh, up the villa. We'll talk to you all soon. See ya. Mm -hmm.